yeah okay so we should be good now and this will all get edited and the audio will get taken out and so yeah if, if, if we say things we can stop and insert a pause and john can go back and cut it out okay just give me a second I, I've, yeah i've got to hit, i've got to hit a button here or something do you understand you're, you want to leave or you're okay with it no got it yeah no that's just, <laughs> I, they need my consent or something it's yes it's I need one of those consent. legal type things all right <clears throat> Michael J. Astru, I'll make that again. Astru. I got it. <laughs> Michael J. Astru has earned degrees from Yale and Harvard. He had a long and distinguished legal career and held several, several government positions as well as leadership posts in biotech companies. From 2007 to 2013, he served as the commissioner of the Social Security Administration. A.M. Juster has published something like 10 books of original and translated poetry and has served as the poetry editor at First Things and now Plow Quarterly, which is one of my favorite journals. These two men might sound like they wouldn't have much in common, but they are in fact the same person. And over the course of our conversation today, you'll hear how these two seemingly different roles might relate to one another. So thank you for joining us on the Brass Platoon podcast today. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Great. So here on the Brass Platoon podcast, we always begin by asking our guests, what does home mean to you? So I thought I would, I would begin there. Home. Well, um, home is, um, for us, I think, for a while, been a fairly split place. So we bought this house where you see the blue wall in the background when we were very young. Uh, we're about 26, I guess. Um, and we've been there, been here ever since. We held on to the house during our stints in Washington. Uh, and about a little bit more than 20 years ago, we started splitting our time. So we bought a house on an island in the middle of Buzzards Bay, about 11 miles west of Martha's Vineyard, a very small community. The island's only two square miles and the southern half is almost uninhabited um, with a sort of a bizarre history. It's the site of the first British attempt to colonize North America. Um, you don't read it about it in the history books because it doesn't fit very well with Manifest Destiny and those kind of things because essentially they stayed for about three weeks and decided this wasn't working, went home and then came back to Virginia five years later where most of them did not live very long. So it's not a great story. But it is, you know, a, an attempt to colonize well before uh, Plymouth Rock. Wow, fascinating. Yeah, and I guess you you sort of alluded to uh, the fact that you've been in and out of Washington for quite a while, moving back and forth. Um, and, and that's why I wanted to, to start off today. Um, you know, over your years of service, you've um, tangled with folks at the National Institute for Health. You've worked in different biotech companies. Uh, you've been on councils related to these issues. And I guess I just would start with kind of a broad question since uh, in the age of COVID, these things are much on our minds. Um, you know, what, what should the man on the street, as it were, think or know about this arena? And, and part, of, part of the framing, I guess, is it seems like so often um, people either get the sense that the National Institute of Health or the CDC are the voice of science and can do no wrong, or they're just the epitome of a corrupt, self-serving elite establishment and then, you know, right. Uh, and I guess, you know, what's the perspective of someone who's been in those rooms and tried to, to do good in difficult circumstances? Well, I think as usual on these things, the truth is somewhere in between. Um, you know, the mother agency, Health and Human Services, um, a constant over the years is that it's a mess. It's huge, it's complicated. Uh, presidents on a bipartisan basis have a practice of appointing people that really aren't very well qualified for the management, the technical complexity, and those types of things. So it, it's overall, it's a poorly run agency. NIH as a sub-agency is generally pretty well run, but it's very insular. Um, and um, it is often its own worst enemy. I mean, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, like the Catholic Church, where they do a lot of great things and that kind of thing, but they sometimes do some horrible things. And when they do, they try to cover it up. 
So I was general counsel there at HHS from 89 to 92. And so um, Tony Fauci was among my clients. And Tony, I like personally, I think he's smart. I think he's well-intentioned, um, but I had some horrible disagreements with him. And, and um, you know, for me, the big thing at the time was uh, the discovery of, the claimed discovery of it, HIV by NIH. Um, and I was suspicious of the claims from the beginning, but um, Tony um, was absolutely adamant that NIH was the inventor and, and not only made that claim, but he and his colleagues were very critical of the French, creating diplomatic issues and, and that type of thing. Um, and, you know, as the story started to unravel, um, you know, they came in, Tony and his people came in when Secretary Lou Sullivan, my boss, was confirmed and basically tried to persuade him to stonewall the Congress on information about the patent situation. And that looked to be going pretty well from Tony's point of view because Sullivan was in awe of NIH. He loved NIH. He wasn't very interested in, in much in the department outside of NIH. And then I took him aback and I said to him, you know, Mr. Secretary, um, the only way you're going to get into trouble on this is if you're part of a cover-up. You know, it's like what a lot of the people in Watergate learned. And I had a convicted Watergate criminal on my wall because he was a past general counsel at HHS. And I said, it's the cover-up, often not the crime, that really gets people in trouble. I said, we don't know what Bob Gallo did. And you ought to call it fair and square. You ought to be straight with the Congress. You ought to be straight with the media. If he didn't do anything wrong, he's got nothing to worry about. And if he did do something wrong, you don't want to be responsible for covering it up. And I persuaded him. And Tony wasn't very happy with me, as you could imagine. But sure enough, I was right, because it turned out Gallo didn't discover HIV. And he ran a pigsty of the lab. Um, and there was a lot to be embarrassed about um, in that. But we didn't have to be embarrassed about the cover-up. So I think he's got blinders. I don't think he does that kind of thing to be um, evil, but I think he's just such an institutional loyalist having been there for 40 years that it's the institutional perspective, not the public interest that drives a certain amount of his decision-making. And that's also one of the reasons why it's problematic to me that he's become the public health official for COVID because he's not much more qualified than I am on that. He's not a public health expert. He's a very fine um, medical researcher. Um, and it is a shame that multiple administrations have allowed the Centers for Disease Control to degrade and no longer be capable of leading the charge on public health issues. So, I mean, I'm very much a supporter of as soon as possible moving responsibility for these types of things out of NIH and back where it belongs at CDC. And I may sound like a bureaucrat saying that, but I think that's just good organizational management because quite frankly, you know, you, you look at Tony's team and I don't see people that have the background training and experience to make complicated judgments. And again, I'm not sure, I think there's been a reversion to form a little bit there. I'm not sure NIH has been entirely straight with the public on and the Congress and all its dealings with China um, on um, COVID and uh, before the, um, the epidemic. And, um, and I'm a little suspicious, to be honest, of some of the claims they're making now with regard to having invented the Moderna product. Um, and I've become more suspicious because I was planning on writing an op-ed piece about it. And I got stonewalled by NIH and have gotten apps, not even gotten a response saying, we're not gonna give you any information. So, you know, um, he's done a lot of good. What I give him the most credit for is HHS in the mid eighties was very slow on um, understanding and responding to HIV. Um, and I think he was an important support player in that. Now, in terms of who took the political risk and showed real leadership, in my book, that was C. Everett Coop, the late Surgeon General. But, you know, I, Tony deserves credit for being on the right side of that and following behind um, Coop and, um, and helping out on that and moving the department 
which was very slow on HIV in the right direction. That's very helpful, I think. And I appreciate your, uh, your perspective there and, and uh, you know, your willingness to, to sort of give praise and blame judiciously and not uh, blanket blanket. And I wonder if part of the, you, you said early on in that, uh, in that comment that um, an institutional mindset sometimes pr prioritizes defending the institution rather than being transparent or, or serving the public good. And I suppose that can be a problem in a lot of bureaucracies that are staffed by, you know, lifetime, lifelong appointments or people who, um, yeah, whose, whose career depends upon that. So is that just part of the um, nature of the beast or are there ways that, uh, that um, things could be improved that would encourage people, incentivize people to have, uh, to be more transparent and to be less defensive, I guess? Yeah, I, um, I think so. I mean, I think I had the advantage of being exquisitely well-trained in this regard. So I, I was a pretty lackadaisical law student generally. I, I really didn't, wasn't into it, to put it mildly. Um, but one of the few courses I attended regularly and enjoyed was taught by a longtime Ted Kennedy staffer and advisor um, named Nick Littlefield. Um, and it was a case of a course called Government Lawyer. Um, and one of the things Nick drove into people, which stuck with me, is that it's important to remember that your client is not the day-to-day -day person that you're dealing with, that the, that the client is the public, yeah. and that your obligation is to do the right thing in the public interest. And if somebody who you know well, you're fond of, who's in your office all the time, is doing something inappropriate, your responsibility is to stop that. Um, and that's hard. That's a very hard thing. You know, it goes against the grain of what lawyers are otherwise trained to do. But it's an important lesson to learn. And, you know, one that a lot of lawyers don't do. And, and it came up time and time again. You know, there was a time, you know, FDA was part of the empire. Um, in those days, and there was a time when some senior people were accused of SEC violations, and I had um, a mammoth argument with David Kessler, who was commissioner at the time, and who I get along with pretty well. I like David, um, but we went at it on this one that about he wanted me and my my lawyers to represent those people in their individual capacity, and I said. David, you know, he had a law degree in addition to a medical degree from a top law school. I said, David, you know I can't do that. And somehow they weren't teaching that at the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and to the point where David even um, sick one of the Maryland senators on me to try to, you know, bully me into um, taking on this representation. Um, and, you know, I, I came back at her with in no uncertain terms, I said, there's no way I'm going to do this. This would be unethical. It would be illegal. It would be inappropriate. No way, no how. And I think that in the, in the introduction to government, most people go through some sort of training program in one way or another. And even political people um, usually go through some training. Now, I'm not sure with the Trump administration whether, you know, people went through a good government training program, but um, I went through several of them and they were quite good. And particularly the, um, the first Bush administration, when I remember with you know, a lot of clarity, I came in late in the second one. So I think I missed the W um, introductory. I think it's important to get those basics across because you know, if you've really studied government and thought about it, I think these things are pretty obvious. But a lot of people haven't, and they've looked at things from a different angle, or they've worked in business before, or um, they've worked in academia before. Um, I actually think my experience with clients at the academics were actually worse than the people that came in, you know, in business in terms of not being sensitive to these kinds of concerns. Um, I had a lot of difficulty with Tony Fauci's second boss, third boss, Bernie Healy. Um, who um, was an academic and a practicing doc out of the Cleveland Clinic. And, and she was a horror to deal with and, and you know, uh, ethical rules and 
responsibility just didn't mean anything to her whatsoever. So it it is difficult in in government to stand up for the right things, and you don't get rewarded for it at the time. You know, you tend to get punished for it. Um, but you know, you have to have you have to have the backbone to stick with it, and in the long run, you end up an awful lot better because people at least around you do actually know and they do start to pay attention. And ultimately, while they may not tell you, I think they do respect you for handling things in the appropriate way. Yeah, that's helpful. And, and it's good too, to, to, as you point out, that these aren't unique problems to government, although they might manifest uniquely in, in that realm. Yeah. Well, I, I want to kind of shift to this dual role you occupy. And um, I, I think Shelley famously writes that uh, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Uh, maybe not, but uh, bureaucrats or civil servants might fit that description. And yet there aren't very many poets who do this kind of work. Uh, they, they, you know, there's a few older ones I can think of. In your generation, it's pretty much you and Dana Joyer that come to mind. Um, yeah, well, there were a lot a long time ago. Right. I mean, it it used to be very norm. common. Yeah, very common. And, you know, basically for, you know, 1500 years of a classical education with the training in rhetoric, that was considered what you needed to be a poet, to argue in court, or to be a politician. And those right. were all sort of closely linked. Um, as um, economies have gotten bigger and government structures have gotten bigger and our other organizations have gotten bigger. Organizations do, I think, what public choice theory predicts. Um, they focus on their own expansion and they focus on improving a lot of the people who are there. And what that means usually is putting up barriers, you know, for exclusion. And so these days, you know, you're really not taken seriously as a writer unless you write full time, which means you have inherited wealth or something like that, um, or you're an academic. Um, and if you're outside, you know, as a poet, if you're outside that area, you know, big poetry by and large doesn't think that you're serious. Um, and so there is this guild mentality and that's been aggravated by, um, by the MFA programs. Um, there's been a huge expansion in the MFA programs and you have a lot of young people running around really persuaded that they can't be a poet or a writer um, if they don't go to an MFA program, which is nuts. Because um, you actually, um, there's very little that's taught in an MFA program that if you put your mind to it, you can't teach yourself, which is what I did. Because I came back to, I was very serious about writing in high school and college, um, and then had a professor in um, college who sat me down basically at the end of the class and told me I had no talent for writing and that I ought to find a different hobby, which is advice that I took um, to heart for about 10 years. And actually it was the aforementioned Dana Joya that got me back on track because I was kind of looking um, for um, something to fill my recreational time. I was pretty busy at work and being a dad um, but my, uh, my bride was actually pressing me to find something. And I actually, I tried golf and I didn't find that that worked for me. Um, and I read Dana Joya's review of Philip Larkin's collective um, in the Washington Post. And it got me interested in reading Larkin, who I barely remembered. Um, and I did, and I started thinking, you know, this is really more the kind of poetry I wanted to be writing rather than bad imitations of modernist poets. And I said, I wonder if I can teach myself how to do that. And I did, and it took me longer than it does today. Today, it's a lot easier because you've got the internet. Right. Um, and there's more of a network um, of formal poets and, and, and that kind of thing. Not as good as it used to be. Dana founded a uh, terrific conference at Westchester um, University in Pennsylvania that was great for about 15 years, and then when um, leadership kind of shifted to back over the university, it sort of fell apart over a five-year period, So, which is sort of sad. But there's still places you can go. There's the Frost Farm Conference in New Hampshire, and you know there are people on Twitter, and there are 
websites and then, and you know, you can, you can teach yourself what you need to know. And a lot of it is just writing um, and, you know, doing a lot of writing and, and practicing and doing exercises and, and that kind of thing. So there's, and, and there's not much that they can tell you in an MFA program, except to read the same things and try the same exercises and that kind of stuff. And you can get feedback from friends and colleagues and that kind of thing. You don't need to get it from um, a university professor who, you know, it seems to me a lot of the times these people are very burned out and tired of what they're doing. And so I'm not sure that the feedback is very helpful a lot of the time. So I'm, I'm essentially self-taught in this area. And I think actually it's an advantage having had a lot of real world experiences outside of academia, I think it gives you more to write about. It makes you think more deeply about things. And I think people that have stayed on a purely academic track, I think they, they run out of things they really want to say. And the poetry tends to become sterile and, and, uh, and not very interesting a lot of the time. So, um, uh, but there are relatively few. I mean, there's some. Archibald MacLeish had a senior role over at State Department in World War II. Um, there's a congressional staffer whose name I'm blanking on. You know, so there's a few scattered around, but you're right. There really aren't a lot. Um, and there aren't a lot at senior ranks and corporations too, um, at least that we know of. And of course, part of the reason I started writing under a pseudonym is, um, you know, my worlds don't really respect each other. You know, right. I, I, you know, if my boss at Biogen had known that I was publishing poetry, you know, he never would have um, stopped trying to humiliate me about it. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, it, I was actually quite happy keeping my world separate. And I still have moments where I think I'd be happier if I'd been able to keep it separate. But the last stint in public service, that wasn't possible. Um, I, had a, I had one union that I worked very well with, um, the National Trans, uh, Treasury Employees Union, but the, uh, the other union um, was impossible to deal with. And when I wouldn't give them everything they wanted, they decided that they would try to destroy me. So they had this whole huge effort to try to find dirt um, and they were very frustrated because they spent like a year and a half and they didn't find anything. And finally, they went through my SF-278 with the Office of Government Ethics and figured out that I had been writing poetry. And so they, they leaked it to someone who normally was very opposed to the agency and didn't like me. And the poor guy couldn't figure out what to do with it. So it was a fairly neutral piece. And at that point, Jody Bottom, who'd been at first things who've been trying to nicely out me for a long time said, okay, now's the time, you know, it's officially known. So you let me do it my way. And he uh, hired Paul Mariani to do a very flattering outing piece in 2010 in first things. But um, it's awkward. So I mean, it was a little awkward as commissioner because, you know, one of the things I tried to do, um, I didn't travel as much as most commissioners. Um, and I spent a lot more time in Baltimore than most commissioners, which is where the headquarters is located. And I think you need to be with your people and you need to have unmediated experiences to figure out what's really going on because as well-intentioned as a lot of your senior people are, there's lots of things that are going on that they don't want you to know. Yeah. Um, and so when I did travel, I did try to visit field offices and I did try to interact with um, employees um, in an unmediated way. And sometimes that involves sort of an informal staff meeting. And I don't know, about one time in 10, some poor person would raise, usually it was her hand because the rank and file, it's probably 70% women, would raise her hand and say something like, I just want you to know that I write poetry too. And I never figured out the right response to that. You know, I just, I, I tried different answers and it just always felt awkward. I didn't know what to uh, say. And the employee probably felt awkward and that kind of thing. So, you know, but um, um, it does make certain things easier, I guess. Um, and um, I, I guess occasionally makes me interesting to people. So. Yeah, I mean, you started off by talking about how 
um, the poetry world doesn't respect folks who uh, don't have MFAs, but I think as you concluded, the, the inverse is often true as well, right? That the government or the high level business world doesn't really respect people who would waste their time yeah. on, on poetry. Yeah, it, it, it's both ways. And it was really the reason for adopting the pseudonym in the first place. I mean, I actually started thinking about it. I was starting to think about publishing. I was still at HHS and um, the Office of Government Ethics passed a rule that said, even if your writing was totally unrelated to your government function, you had to disclose every single publication to your supervisor. And I started thinking about, here I am trying to publish poetry for the first time. How am I gonna walk into a cabinet official and say, you know, Lou, here's what I'm doing these days. Just, it was just way too awkward. So I actually waited until I left the government before um, I started trying to actually publish. And at that point I had no legal obligation to tell anybody about it. And particularly, you know, at Biogen, where I had a very difficult yes. CEO, um, I'm actually really glad I never had to have that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, in thinking about these, uh, th these kind of uh, shifts and the sort of different worlds that you, you lived in, I, I thought about your poem in your recent book, uh, Vertigo. I wonder if you would read that for us or yeah. comment on that. Uh, because it's sort of, it's a very personal poem, but it's also then gets political and uh, it's an interesting mix, I think, of these two worlds. Thank you. So this is um, from the most recent book, which is Wonder and Wrath from Paul Dry Books. Vertigo. The world turns liquid, wheels and rolls as gravity veers at angles. What was still is blurred and whirled. Revolutions echo. You lie still for hours, too weak for vomiting, and still two days for prayer. No whiz-bang device can repair your inner ear. Doctors try shifting crystal shards like sad wizards. Sometimes it's magic, sometimes not. They never know. They never know what to advise if that trick fails. Focus your eyes on horizons, one whispered once. It helps to refocus the brain. The brain resets. The brain can reset in the ways my father's did when his tumor nicked a vein, cells drowned in blood. His bloodied brain regathered words, word, word by word. Grace is not crystalline, but grit that squit squints at pain. Grace is the will to retake things, thing, thing by thing. Yeah, thank you. I just love the, the idea that um, we can lose balance. We can, we can uh, be overthrown in an instant, you know, and that can be a revolution, but maybe recovery is necessarily uh, a slower, more incremental process and, and grace. I love that last line about grace thing, thing by thing. Yeah, uh, it's, 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 it's an interesting thing. thing. So th there are some things in there that are pretty evident connections. So, you know, my dad, uh, died of the same rare brain cancer that got Ted Kennedy and John McCain. Wow. And so that's the illusion at the end. Um, and he, we thought we had lost him early on with the cerebral hemorrhage. His, his early um, struggle with the disease was actually much worse than the two senators. But he, he made it an amazing way back. And I did watch, you know, it's like with a lot of stroke victims, um, it's amazing how the brain can rewire. And he got, he was a brilliant guy and he got about 95% of the way back wow. before he started sliding again. And so that's pretty visible in the poem. The, but the other thing that's not visible is, and, and this goes back to my point about having real world experiences. Um, in my second biotech uh, gig, I turned around a failing company that I had been with before. Um, and it had been a mile wide and an inch deep and threw overboard a lot of interesting science to basically focus on a handful of rare genetic diseases, mostly of children, um, that would be fatal. Um, and aside from being a good cause, it allowed me to turn the company around quickly because they were from the old biotech model where basically what was wrong is you're missing one protein. So you make the protein, you put it into the body, you can largely fix the disease. So we could try to fix the company quickly and it worked. Um, 
But part of that for me, the experience of Wakefield School is an amazing experience because in contrast to my previous stint with the company, I, you know, we had a new focus and I worked a lot with the patient groups, which really were generally parents of children. Um, and they were some of the most remarkable people I ever met. And you would, I think you would jump to the conclusion that, okay, well, these are parents that are trying to save their children. And yes, there were a certain number of parents that were in that situation. But what was remarkable is how many of the, the parents were still there and working hard, but already lost their children or knew that they were going to lose their children. And it didn't matter. And they were mm. still working, you know, just as hard. Um, and I was um, tremendously moved by these parents. Um, and so one of the things, you know, morale was horrible in the company. Um, and, you know, the mission had been unclear and everyone thought we were going to shut down and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So one of the things I started doing was um, with the consent of the parents, in fact, cooperation parents, uh, we started taking pictures of these children and getting the parents to write a few paragraphs about the child's story. And we just started putting them up on the main corridor in the, um, in the company. And um, that was a critical thing, I think, in turning around the morale. Um, you know, we announced layoffs when I came back because we needed to conserve the company. I didn't have to lay off anywhere near as many people as we announced because people were quitting so quickly. But then the bleeding stopped, the corporate bleeding stopped and people got very um, behind the mission. Um, the company turned around quickly. Um, of course, my reward for that is I lost the company in a hostile takeover, but you know, <laughs> you know these things happen. Um, but you know, I think it was, I think thinking about those parents um, that, you know, got me thinking about grace, which was not a subject I had written about in poetry before that. And that's, for me, that's underlying a lot of this poem, but you could be a very close reader of the poem and you'd never even sort of guess that. Mm. Uh, but that is, for me, it's part of the undercurrent of the poem. Oh yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. And I think um, that gets to it at some of the, um... The, the kind of, you know, your, your poetry is religious sometimes, but not usually explicitly. It's political, but not explicitly or partisanly. Uh, but these undercurrents or these themes are are present, I think, for, for a discerning reader who is attentive to them. Um, it gives it a certain depth, right? There's some, there's some substance there, which I think it's back to what you said earlier about some MFA type of, at least the, the cliched workshop poem often has a very superficial shine, but then you wrap on it and there's not much underneath. There's not much there there in most, most cases. Yeah, yeah. Um, I all, I, you know, this is a kind of uh, sort of medical and, and very personal poem. I, I also wanted to ask you sort of about political poetry. And I, I saw that uh, right after the 2016 election, you recommended Wilbur's beautiful poem for the student strikers, which I, was a great poem. Um, and, and you have a nice little, little, I think, uh, analysis of it or sort of description of why, why you recommended that. Um, and, and yet you usually like Wilbur, I guess, issue politics in your poetry, but there is this humor, this, uh, concern for people, this concern for how we relate to one another, which is of course marks that Wilbur poem. I mean, it opens, go talk with those who are rumored to be unlike you and whom it is said you are so unlike, right? Um, so how might you describe the, the kind of political work that you imagine or aspire to in your poetry? Um, what, what is your, yeah, how, how would you think about that dimension of your work? Well, again, you know, a lot of what I learned was by trial and error. So I think when I was first writing, I, I actually did try my hand at more political poetry. And usually in the heat of the moment, I thought it was great stuff. Um, but um, a couple of my friends said, well, why don't you put that in the drawer for a while, go back and look at it. And, and that was good advice, because when I did, you know, it just didn't feel right. And of course, you know, the situations change so fast if you're writing about partisan politics, that it doesn't have very much of a shelf life. And given how long it takes to get a poem, you know, accepted and then published, um, you've published something that probably people are scratching their head by the time it's published. So I think what you're trying to do is 
in the politics of, of your poetry, if, you, if that's what you're writing about, is to try to figure out some of the things that people should be thinking about that are um, more timeless, that are recurring um, themes. And I think, um, and sometimes when you do that, you often connect um, more broadly um, with people than you think, and people see significance that, in fact, you have to admit, if you're being honest, you didn't even see yourself. So the, the first poem that I had that really was a big success um, was a poem called Moscow Zoo, yeah. um, which won the Nemiroff Sonnet Award in 95. Um, and, you know, that was basically written because of a New York Times uh, article that really struck me. Um, and um, when I wrote it, I think I was thinking very hard about the scene and trying to get people to, to feel what this was like and that kind of thing. And, and it, it's amazing to me that the poem continues to have the legs that it has. I think it's um, still the first or second one that been most anthologized that people ask me to read and that kind of thing and and people continue to see things and relate relate it to things now that I couldn't have possibly anticipated and I think that is sort of the test of a good poem you know you look at some of the great political poetry for instance of Yeats that people yeah. keep going back to in times of um, crisis um, it's it's hitting that chord on of sort of the recurring issues that is really, I think, what's important for poets to try to do um, uh, in poetry. Um, you know, we lost one of our great poets in the last year or so, um, Adam Zagajewski. And yeah. he, you know, wrote what I think was the first poem to go viral, which is try to um, praise this mutilated world. Yeah. And it's is at least it reads to me very much as a 9-11 poem and the reason it went viral was all the connections with 9-11 but people keep going back to that poem because it's so resonant it touches with so many things that are at the core of thinking about society that people keep coming back to it to the point now where you've got people reading and quoting this poem and talking about it who don't remember 9-11 yeah um, and, and that's the mark of, I think, a, a truly great poem. So I think if you're motivated to try to write poetry with a political resonance, I think what's important is to try to think about the deeper recurring issues and ways to get those across in a very visceral kind of way without tying it into the, the partisan disputes of the moment. Yeah, although, you know, Moscow Zoo or a Yeats poem are often very occasional, right? Their responses to particular events, they're very particular and specific. But, but yes, as you say, they're not limited by the, the narrow partisan response. They, they, they tap into these sort of human uh, dynamics <clears throat> in, in response to tragedy or turmoil or conflict. Yeah, and I think that you know, one of the things I've finally stumbled into a little bit is, you know, Sometimes you question I hate, which I'm glad you haven't asked, is where do you get the ideas for your poems? Um, and I'd give you the back of the hand if you ask me that question. But, <laughs> you know, part, one of the tricks I think is, is latching on to an image or a word or a phrase or something that really moves you, something that really interests you and moves you. And, and, and maybe you don't even, maybe preferably, you don't even really understand why. And then you start to explore it. And those usually I think are the foundations for the really the best poems. Um, and usually if you pick something that resonates really deeply with you, you probably haven't thought through even all the reasons why it resonates with you. Yeah. You, know, you, you, know, you might get some of the mo more important ones. Um, and then you get the benefit that, you know, people keep seeing things in the poem that are there in a real sense but you can't honestly say that you crafted it to get that particular point across. That's right. Yeah, that's helpful. Okay, but I don't want to give listeners the wrong impression. They might think that you're really serious. So I, I need to read this uh, this uh, 
poem of yours, a stern warning to Canada. This is very political, right? Okay, here you go. It is. I, yeah, there you go. If you want peace, withdraw your geese. Uh, <laughs> there, you have this great sense of humor, and and there are many longer poems I could point to as well. I mean, your your Billy Collins poems, or uh, many of them. They, there's just this dry, biting humor. And uh, yet so often, well, our political discourse is incredibly humor, humorless. And so much poetry, you know, there's a, a kind of skepticism, I guess, of light verse, that it's light, that it's not serious. But uh, you have, I think, uh, really cultivated a kind of deep humor, a humor that's um, funny, but that then resonates. So I don't know, talk to me about, this is a bit of a terrible question, but what's the importance of humor and, and how... What 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 goes wrong when we close ourselves off from the humorous? Well, I think part of my worldview, you know, you try to figure out how you're going to allocate your time and and do things. You know, generally, I mean, this sounds corny, but you want to try to make a positive impact on the world, and that's the reason for doing public service. You know, when I left public service in '92, I briefly was in a law firm, and, and you know, as law firms go, it was a wonderful law firm, but I didn't have that same sense of mission that I then got in biotech. But I think that carries over into the poetry too. I mean, you, for me, it's like Horace's satires, you know, with how we translate Sermones. But Sermones probably in Rome at the time meant more something closer to conversations. Or, or, and it's where the word sermon comes from. And, um, you know, I view a poem almost like a sermon. It, it's an opportunity um, in a, uh, you know, non-institutional way to try to get people to think about the things that matter in the world um, in, a, in a broader way. And that's ex exciting. It's interesting to try to do. Um, and you also feel if you've done it right, that you've done something of value. And I think that that value can come in a lot of ways. And, and poets tend to be excessively focused on you know, the, the lacrimose um, and, and find humor difficult. And light verse has kind of gone out of fashion, regrettably. Um, but I think making someone laugh in and of itself is a valuable thing. And if while you're doing it, you get people to see an irony or uh, an institutional shortcoming that maybe they hadn't seen before, then that's the frosting on the cake. That's more of a benefit. So, um, so I do like writing live. You know, it's a funny thing. I wrote a fair amount for a long period of time. And I don't know how much of this is about me and how much of this is about our world recently. I have not written very much. Um, humorous verse for four or five years now. Um, and of course, I've been pretty focused on translation the last couple of years. Um, but I am hoping to get back. I hope, I'm, I hope I haven't lost my sense of humor, but thank you. Good, good. Well, that's a good segue. I wanted to talk briefly too about your translation work because that's a big part of it, especially, I know, uh, your current project, which I understand is Maybe almost done. Or, or some, almost some, done, yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's, a, it's a monster too. And I'm, I'm kind of almost astonished that I can use the phrase almost done. So. We'll talk about that. How do you, it's a very eclectic list of poets that you translate, um, including, I think, as I mentioned, Billy Collins. So if you haven't read uh, A.M. Juster's translations of Billy Collins, you're missing out. But um, maybe on the more serious ones, how do you choose which ones to, to translate? Why Petrarch? Uh, what's the value of, of kind of recovering these voices that we might otherwise not have access to? I started translating as I mentioned, when I was kind of teaching myself to write formal poetry, really just as an exercise. And then at some point you start checking and saying, well, how good is this? And you look at what gets published and, and I kind of then realize, well, you know, I think this is pretty competitive. And, and I got positive reinforcement. It was actually easier for me, um, particularly in the beginning to publish the translations than my own original poetry. So I, I got that reinforcement. And then at some point, you know, I started realizing that there was some really interesting poetry that had not been translated into English or hadn't been translated in my book terribly well. 
where there was an opportunity to come in and try to give people something of value. And so um, I basically, when I was doing my own reading, I keep a, a list of, of poets that I'm either sure or I think might be interesting to translate. And then when I've got the time and energy, um, I go down to Widener Library at Harvard and bury myself in, in books for a while to try to figure out which poet seems to be fitting my mood at the time. Um, it is one of the real freedoms of being a non-academic. If you're an academic, there's expectations that you're going to translate a certain kind of, if you're an English professor, you know, whatever, if your field is 18th century French literature, that's what they'll expect you to translate. And if you're in an MFA program, there's a lot of pressure to translate contemporary poets. Um, and so that leaves a big open area. And, um, uh, and I've been happy to be in that area. And, and it's allowed me without any of the normal credentials or connections or anything to you know, get published by major um, university presses. Um, and um, you know, um, Oxford, Penn, University of Toronto. Um, and now for the first time a major commercial. Yeah. So I'm, I'm doing a, a complete translation of Petrarch's Cancenary, um, which is uh, very difficult to translate if you're doing it in meter and rhyme and you're trying to stay faithful to the Italian. And I wasn't at, sh at all sure I could do it. I actually took a stab at it 20 years ago and it was um, an unmitigated failure. Um, but um, I've um, picked up some tricks along the way um, and um, having had to retire from, from work, um, you know, I've got a lot more time, you know, to spend on these things than before. So it's a, this particular project was one that Dana Joya talked uh, me and a very fine poet translator named Catherine Tufariello into doing at Westchester in 1999. Um, and I did a lot of Petrarch for a year and a half, um, but really not at a pace and a quality to, to do very much with most of it. And so I set it aside um, and I came back to it shortly before the pandemic. Um, and I'm not quite sure why, but I just had this feeling that maybe I could do it better and faster and that kind of thing. And I actually did it in a fairly cold blooded way um, because you know, I'm 65, I've got health issues. I said, if this is gonna take me 15 years to do, um, then this is probably a bad idea. Um, so I kind of worked out the numbers, looked at what the pace would have to do and said, look, I basically have to clear out everything I, else I'm doing for three years. Um, to try this and I'll do a little experiment demonstration project for three months to see whether I can actually produce at that rate and, and, and whether I'm still happy doing it. So I, I did a little trial period and then the pandemic hit. So it was a little easier to stay focused on it. Um, and it actually went better and faster than I anticipated because I had budgeted three years for it and I was able to get to the complete draft in 21 months. So what I'm doing now <clears throat> is I'm editing um, and I've been doing um, an independent round and I've also hired a very talented formal poet um, and translator who lives in Italy to give it a one over. So I've got two different rounds of editing going and I'm working on the notes and, and that kind of thing. But um, uh, I should be handing it in to W.W. W. Norton in April, and it should be out about a year later, so 2023. And it's um, it's in a brand that I'm very honored to be a part of. Um, you know, the big name, and it's a fairly new brand at Norton. Um, but Emily Wilson's, um, the the Iliad came out of this brand, yep. which is a tremendously successful um, book, and Aaron Pachigan. Um, is publishing under that and Alicia Stallings and Michael Palma and that kind of thing. So they've got a real, you know, impressive group of people. So I'm, I'm just happy to be invited into that club, you know, at all. And, um, and I think that they'll do a great job um, getting the book out, particularly in universities. Um, 
and I think it's time because people don't read Petrarch very much anymore. Um, and I think the, you know, the up until about 1970, all the translations were very loose on the Italian and, you know, tended to fudge, you know, fudge a lot because of the formal constraints. And they were persuaded wrongly somehow that Petrarch was a troubadour and they put all this sort of pseudo medieval claptrap into the poems that isn't there because Petrarch wasn't a troubadour. Um, this is, these poems are the beginning of confessional poetry. This is a man who knew from the get-go when he was lusting after a married woman that he was, he was sinning and he went ahead and did it anyway. Um, and he was, you know, someone who had taken minor orders in the church. Um, and, um, and then there's the evolution of thought um, where uh, he moves from base desires to basically there's a Boethian spin on this where, you know, she becomes the vehicle to regaining his faith. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a momentous story. Um, it doesn't deserve to be written in an anachronistic fashion. The language was, it was a move from Latin to Italian not long after Dante did it and about the same period where, where Chaucer was doing it, Boccaccio was doing it. So the language was very fresh and contemporary at the time. And it hadn't, you know, wasn't written that way through 1970. And then there was a tremendous philological quote unquote literal version that came out from Robert Durling um, which is very helpful for getting the Italian right, but is painful to read. And, and again, that's not a criticism. He was trying to get it very precise and literal and word for word, but poetry doesn't work that way. There was a very funny comic this past week in Rhymes with Orange about um, paraphrasing poetry and readings and where, you know, you, you're reading a Robert Frost poem, but just paraphrasing it. And it's just like, well, that's ridiculous. You know? um, and, um, and so we have had, since um, the Durling, had a few editions, but we've kind of lost the poetry. Um, and I think the Durling translation has been so intimidating that I think poets, have, or translators have been intimidated from deviating very far from it. Um, and so we've kind of lost the rhythm, the love of language, the joy. I think some of the religious, um, aspects of it have been played down. I think there's a little bit of humor there. I don't want to overstate that. I mean, lot, there are people who think Petrarchan humor is an oxymoron, but he did have sort of a wry sense of humor that um, I think got translated out because people kind of thought of him as humorless and it is sort of a trap. Um, I went, when I was still in Washington last time, I went to the Folger Shakespeare Theater to see a uh, production of Macbeth that was co-produced by Teller of Penn and Teller, who actually is quite a Shakespearean scholar. Um, and I went to this talk that he gave beforehand that was packed, mostly because there were all these fans of Penn and Teller that wanted to hear Teller talk for the first time. And one of the points that Teller made that stuck with me is that Macbeth tends to be portrayed more darkly than Shakespeare intended because of this image of it as a dark play and, and you know, the mythology that actors die you know, during it and that kind of thing. Um, and the, um, the comic relief that Shakespeare wrote for the play tends to get portrayed. So it's not really terribly much of, much of a relief unlike you know, in, in other plays and that part of Teller's mission with this particular production was to put that back you know, in the play. And I think that there's the same phenomenon with Petrarch. I think that he's translated in a, um, in such a somber way all the time that, that the times where he's, he is more lighthearted, um, where he is actually making a right joke or that type of thing is missed. And then there's, you know, there are other poems too that, you know, obviously he's very important in terms of form. He was not an inventor, but he was the popularizer of the sonnet. He was the popularizer of the Sistina. Um, and, um, and he had some courage when it came to politics in a time where 
you made a misstep in politics, you really you could be dead, you know, very quickly, you know, particularly Italian politics at the time. Um, but, um, you know, there are three, there's a sequence called the Babylon Sonnets that um, are attacking corruption in the church. They were very strong and very forceful and were actually were banned by the Vatican for a number of years. The Beinecke Library at Yale has online a marvelous um, image of a medieval manuscript where they had gone to great efforts to take, I think their poems 136 through 138 to, to try to scrub them out of this gorgeous um, manuscript. Um, he also had wrote some, he didn't write to us, he wrote in a lot of different forms and he wrote longer poems called Canzones. And one of them um, really became a rallying point for unified Italy. And that took another 600 years. Mm -hmm. But in terms of Italians thinking of themselves as a nation, you know, Petrarch was an incredibly important factor in that. So there's all kinds of, for me, there's all kinds of interesting stuff in there. Um, he's not taught very often. So there is a real opportunity that I think Norton has to get the book out there into great books programs and, and other places. And, and that's, for me, that's a very exciting prospect. I mean, I do think that um, this is going to be, um, I, th I think that probably with a year after the book goes out, again, this may just be the optimism where you're still working on it, but um, I think that there'll be more people that have read that, will have read that translation than everything else I've written up to this point in time. So for, for me, we've been working at this reasonably seriously. Um, for over a quarter century and you know exclusively really for the last eight years it's a very exciting prospect so but i still have to get it done. i have to get yeah. it completely done <laughs> well thanks for the preview and uh hopefully that what's yeah. what's full's appetites for the uh the book in about a year and a half maybe yeah. Well, I wanted to ask, I wanted to conclude maybe with uh, asking about one more hat that you wear. You wear a lot of different hats, but your editorial hat, uh, you, you've, you've edited First Things and now Plow. Uh, you obviously have your own uh, aesthetic standards, uh, you know, in terms of your interest in form. But, uh, but I found you to, to curate a pretty generous selection of styles and, and tones and approaches in those publications. So uh, what do you hope to accomplish, I guess, in your editorial work as well. So I guess where I am, fortunately, I've had journals that are pretty simpatico, which is why they've invited me to do it, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I would say Plow, it, we clearly have a tilt toward formal verse. Yeah. That's my preference. But you know, it, it is interesting. I think the, the editors more broadly are very interested in poetry, and they've got a tilt toward formal verse too. So we started um, a um, poetry competition to honor a mentor of mine, Rena S. Bayat. Um, and the idea for this, truly no one believes me on this. Everyone assumes this is my idea and I would love to take credit for it, but it really was the head editor, Peter Momsen's idea, who's a big fan of Rena's. Um, and as we were talking about it, I said, look, let's not do it the way everyone else does, which is charge a lot of money for participating um, and, um, um, hiring a big shot judge to, you know, get publicity and, you know, skim off a little bit of the money that's left over. Um, I said, I'll, I'll do the screening, which is a lot of somewhat painful work. Yeah. Um, and, and I'll deliver approximately 20 poems. So I'm not calling the shots and, and all that kind of stuff. And I'll, I'll look at it blind. Um, and, you know, you, the editors can embrace it as a whole. And I was really pleased at how in depth, how carefully they had read it, um, how almost everyone on the editorial board participated, how healthy the debate was. Um, and we ended up with three formal poems. Um, and, um, and that was a little bit of a surprise to me because I think I delivered 19 and it was pretty even between free verse mm -hmm. and formal poems. Um, so, you know, I tried to be um, even handed about that. Um, and for me, I mean, I think the aesthetic thing that's the big one is, is this poem going to be accessible to a reasonably intelligent reader? 
for me, there's no reason. I mean, if a reader of Plow is going to open the magazine and read the poem and, you know, is a fairly intelligent, well-educated person and, and say, I have no idea what this is about or this is just off-putting, you know, that kind of thing. Well, I think you've kind of failed on mission. Yeah. Um, and so for me, it's not so much whether it's a formal poem, it's whether it's accessible and it's trying to say something worthwhile. Um, and so that's, I think, really the aesthetic. Um, and I would think if you've got people out there who want to submit, I mean, there's a, it's free if you subscribe to Plow. And as you mentioned, it's a great journal. Um, yes. So, you know, it can be a freebie if you're doing the right thing and subscribe to the journal. It, by poetry standards, it's a small fee if you're not a subscriber to the journal. So it's a pretty good deal. Um, and, um, and I also, one of the things I, I ask for is to have two runner-ups because, you know, when it's entirely hit or miss and there's only one winner, sometimes, you know, sometimes those two that are awful close actually turn out to be um, as good or better than the, the poems that win. Um, so we have two runner-ups and they were really fine. All three of them. Yeah, very, they were. Very fine poems. Um, and we ended up publishing, I think, three more um, that were actually not even winners because, you know, they were, they were so good. So I'm hoping that, you know, it continues. Um, you know, it's, um, I think it's a good competition, you know, based on some good ideas and it's honoring, you know, a wonderful um, poet who's done a lot um, for poetry, not only in this country, but in her original home, the Dominican Republic. So um, I'm excited about it. So yeah, so accessibility and something to say um, and, and, and liveness of language and that kind of thing. I mean, I don't want to read op-ed pieces. Um, I don't want to read things from scratching. Well, I don't have hair and stuff. So right. I'm scratching my head saying, you know, what is this person really trying to say here? Yeah. Um, and so I'm not, I mean, it is true. It's not really a competition for people who are quote unquote experimental poets. But that it ties in with the mission of the organization. I mean, if the journal were different, if it were a journal of experimental literature, then obviously it would be different. But it's a it's um, it's a journal that's aimed at general readers who are interested in culture, literature, theology, yeah. you know, politics, you know, um, on a on a higher you know level, and um, you know, trying to come up with poetry that's meaningful for the people that are readers of the journal. Yeah, excellent. And I think, you know, a lot of the things you said that you're looking for maybe also describe your own verse, uh, accessible, uh, but not in a demeaning sense, but in a sense that you can read it and, and understand what's going on. And then you read it a few more times and there's, it, it rewards uh, repeated, repeated readings um, and, and touches on these broader themes, but is not bound by a sort of narrow understanding of any of them. So that's certainly what I'm trying to do. Good. <laughs> well, this was a delightful conversation. I really well, thank you for, it. for inviting. This has been um, enjoyable. The time went by very quickly and I'm, I'm grateful for your time and attention. Yeah. I hope uh, listeners will, will check out your work. I think you have a website. Is your website just amjuster? Uh, amjuster.net. Yes. Um, and I have a Twitter site uh, at amjuster. Yes. Um, and, and, and you said at. earlier about how, you know, there's these networks online of foremost poets. And I would say your Twitter handle is a pretty pretty good place to get plugged into such a network. I think that's right. I mean, I think if you're interested, I mean, there are a lot of people there for a lot of different reasons, but I think most of the people who are active in, on the internet in formal poetry have showed up sooner or later. So, um, uh, and it's, um, and, it, and I'm pretty active on it. I mean, I'm, I think some people don't really understand, but you know, a lot of it really ties in particularly with the translation because one of the things if you're doing it well doing formal translation you know your head just really starts to hurt after a while and, and you're doing well you know in addition to the the interesting lofty thinking you're doing a lot of grinding work on thinking about how many different ways you can restructure a sentence and yeah. what the alternatives really are for rhymes and everything. and so you reach a point where before too long, you have to take a break and you have to do something. Um, and so, you know, the, for me, the, the Twitter is a little bit how I wake up my brain in the morning. And then when I'm taking breaks 
you know, during the day. And so, yeah. you know, I post fairly regularly. So if you're interested in formal poetry or, or just poetry and, you know, the traditions over uh, the last couple thousand years, um, it's a place to be. If you're looking for the, the hot poetry of the day from big poetry, it's the wrong place to be. But there are plenty, plenty of places where you can go for that. There aren't very many places you can go that look like mine. Yeah. I agreed. Well, thank you so much. It was a delightful to talk with you. And I, uh, you. I'm looking forward to your Petrarch translation. Well, I'm looking forward to getting it done at this point. I've got some other things I want to do. I've got, particularly, I've got a couple of essays I've been suppressing that I'm really eager to get to. So hopefully Good. I'll have it done, done, done in April. You know, I have some, I'm sure some back and forth with copy editors and they're going to bring in a, an outside expert to do it one, give it one last go over. So I'll be busy on it with it on and off overall next year. But starting in April, I'm hoping to have some real time to do some other things. Excellent. Well, we'll look forward to that. Thanks a lot, Jeff. I appreciate it. Thanks.